Hello there. What is going on, everybody? Today, I've got a special treat for you because I'm going to be bringing you my review of the Marvel Crisis Protocol Core Set. Now, this is an early access review copy sent to me from Atomic Mass Games, so I want to give a big thank you to Atomic Mass Games for sending this out and giving me the opportunity to bring this to you guys because I have definitely been looking forward to this one since I first saw it at Gen Con, and it's fantastic to finally be able to sit down and play a game with the core set. Now, this is a competitive game where you will be building a list and challenging someone else, but the core set does give you enough stuff to sit down and play with someone else using only the stuff that comes in the core set. So that is going to be the primary focus of this review, is the internalization of the core set. Uh, however, there is a whole lot more to this game, uh, including competitive stuff and a lot of expandability, which if you are interested in that, I invite you to click that subscribe button because I will be bringing to you more information about Marvel Crisis Protocol as it becomes available, as expansions come out. So make sure you click that subscribe button if you're interested in games like this. And if not, well, we'll see what you think by the end of the video. Also, do want to remind you guys that there is a big $100 Amazon gift card giveaway going on right now, and that's running until the first week of November. So uh, stay tuned for that. If you are interested in entering to win that, you just have to be a subscriber and leave a comment on this or one of my videos. Let me know what your favorite character from the core set is in the comment section below. You'll be automatically entered to win, and I typically announce the winners at the end of my videos, and that'll be coming the first week of November. And if you don't win this one, there's plenty more giveaways because I'm always running giveaways. So. With that said, let's go ahead and jump right into Marvel Crisis Protocol. So Marvel Crisis Protocol is a tabletop miniatures game where you're going to bring a force versus another force. And it's a game of moving, attacking, securing objectives, picking up objectives, and trying to have the most victory points by the end of the game. The game lasts six rounds, and you have the option of either just trying to have the most victory points or trying to completely table your opponent by knocking out all of their characters, although it's going to be a lot harder to actually do that than to just secure victory points. When characters move, they're going to use these little maneuver tools here, like small, medium, and long range for movement, and they'll be able to uh, have a joint here and they'll be able to move. Every character is going to get two actions, so you might move and attack. You might do an action that's listed on your action bar. Uh, and when we're attacking, we're going to be measuring range using these range tools. We've got range five, four, three, and two. And we also have range one, which is going to be half the width of one of these. So range two is about triple the length of range one. And we can use these to measure from our character to see if something is in range. This game also uses a lot of terrain as interactive terrain. And the, the, the course that comes with all the, the terrain that you see here, it comes with an awful lot of bits of terrain. They're very cool. You've got two cars, two dumpsters. Uh, you've got the Daily Bugle newsstand. You've got a lot of smaller bits like a trash can and a couple of lights and street lights. And a lot of this stuff is really cool because in addition to possibly providing cover, it can also be thrown or picked up and thrown and you can potentially hurl a car at somebody and do lots of damage to them, so which is really, really very cool, and it's very exciting, and it kind of makes your table more dynamic. Now, you'll notice this is a little bit of a smaller surface I have set up, and unlike a lot of other tabletop miniatures games that I cover, this game is going to play on a 3x3 board, as opposed to a 3x6 or a 4x6 like a lot of your other games do. Now, that means that you can get this on a much smaller tabletop surface. It does not require a huge table, and that's a big advantage of this game. Also, the fact that it plays smaller also means it tends to play a little bit faster, which means means setup is a little bit easier, it means actual gameplay is a little bit easier, a little bit faster, and you're not going to have these four-hour games. You know, a, a standard game, at least from the from the core set alone, tends to run for about an hour, so it's really not uh, as lengthy of a game as you might expect. I would probably equate this in terms of setup and length a little bit more similar to a game like X-Wing Miniatures, which it plays on a similar surface and has about a similar number of figures per side. So the, uh, you know, in actually having a number of units to activate, it's a little bit closer to that in terms of speed and, and weight. So that is about it for like the overview. Uh, but all of these different characters um, have these incredibly detailed miniatures. Now, mine are not fully painted yet. I uh, have a little mishap with priming, which I covered in another video. If you're interested in that, I will put a link to that up in the corner at the end of the video. But uh, but they are really beautiful miniatures. And uh, they, they are like some of the highest quality miniatures I've seen. 
So I absolutely love them. Big fan of having Captain America on my tabletop. He is definitely, uh, I think, my favorite Marvel superhero. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's very, very cool. Now, one another cool thing about this is you do not have factions. You don't have to run all heroes versus all villains. If I wanted to take maybe uh, Red Skull here and team him up with Cap uh, and maybe, you know, say that Cap was Hydra or Red Skull had been converted to be an honorary Avenger, he had seen the error of his ways or whatever, I could totally do that. So there are no factions. You can totally mix and match. But there are also super groups that if you run all Avengers or, or most of your team is actually Avengers or most of your team is actually Cabal or presumably someday, you know, other super groups will also be in here. I believe the Asgard is coming and they're going to have all of those. You can also get, uh, you know, specific bonuses for having those type of teams like new cards will become available to you that you can play if your team is the majority of you know a specific type of super group which is also very cool which gives you incentive to maybe run all avengers uh but we're going to look at those the cards that uh have all of the character information on them and explain a little bit about what goes into each character all right so here we've got captain america's Card. And we're going to take a look at him. We've got the artwork over here. We've got his name. And it's uh, in case they ever want to do other versions of Captain America, it says this is Steve Rogers. So if we got, you know, maybe the Falcon version or the Winter Soldier version of Captain America or, you know, Bucky Cap or something like that, then that would allow it them to identify that slightly differently. And we've got a bunch of numbers and stats over here. So uh, first off, we've got his uh, health, he's got five hit points basically. Uh, we've got his movement right here, which means he uses the medium movement, which is kind of middle like, -right, right? So it's kind of like speed two, and that's gonna be this one that's identified by the M, we, you know, as opposed to the short range movement or the long range movement, which is even longer than that. Um, then we've got his size, his size two. That is going to come into play if we need to see if he has line of sight over another object, like you could be able to see over something that's smaller than you, no problem. It also has a lot to do with if you're thrown, basically how big you are. A lot of your typical human type characters are gonna be size two. Some of the larger characters may be size three. And it does kind of scale up all the way up to size five. So in theory, if you did some kind of Galactus type figure, they might be size five. Uh, and then over here, we've got their threat value, or this is basically their point cost. So when you're building an army, you're going to have a certain amount of points, and that is where you come up with how many points he is worth if you're putting him on your team. Now below that, we've got some different values here. We have uh, melee. This is basically the, how many defense dice they're going to use against each different type of attack. And if you'll notice, his different attacks are listed down here. They're also going to have they're all going to have that melee symbol, that little punchy fist and you're gonna have three different types of attacks you've got like energy uh types of blasts like iron man will shoot a lot of energy blasts like for example here's iron man's card you see he's got the repulsor blast but you've also got this uh this mystic psionic eyeball here which is going to be like things like magic um, which is a different type of attack altogether and uh, i don't believe any of the characters in the core set shoot any type of magical mystic attacks but uh, those are there so there's additional stuff uh you know for future expansion um, but basically, if you get attacked by an attack, this is how many dice you're going to roll in defense. So if you'll notice, for example, Cap has a strong melee defense and also a strong energy defense because of his shield. But if somebody tried to cast some type of magic spell on him, well, he's a little bit less resilient against that type of, uh, that type of attack. And that's kind of how we differentiate those things. Now, down below, we've got the different attacks that Cap can do if he takes an attack action. Uh, first, he's got Strike. We're gonna see all of the text that the attack does, uh, but over here we're gonna see next to Strike, we're gonna see a couple of things. And I'm actually gonna start from the right and work my way to the left. Now, all, all the way to the right, you have, see this power symbol. Now that's gonna be how much energy, how much power uh, it, it costs. And that's gonna be something you're gonna be getting, you're gonna get this energy every turn. And this is basically just your character building up to bigger and better attacks. You can't start off with your ultimate attack. You've kind of gotta build up to it. So you're gonna get these tokens each turn and other circumstances are also gonna award you these tokens. And you can spend these to power attacks that have a cost. This particular attack of strike is free though. It does not cost any energy. So the zero is, is certainly good. If we go down to see his shield slam, that one's going to cost two. So that's not something he can just use indiscriminately. He has to kind of, you know, plan and budget out some of those attacks. 
Um, next is the barbell. That's gonna be how many dice you roll. We'll talk about combat, and we'll look at the different dice faces here in a moment. Um, and then the next one is the range. So this one, the, the, his strike can only be used at range two. And a lot of melee attacks are limited to range two, which is only about three inches. Um, uh, so it, it basically says, after this attack is resolved, the character gains energy equal to the number of damage dealt. So, you know, the more he hits you, the more he's going to power up for maybe a shield slam, right? And it also has the ability to push a character, and you can push them away, and pushing characters away is very important. And it's one of the things that makes this game interesting is that a lot of your attacks are moving people around the battlefield in a game that is objective-oriented. Uh, repositioning somebody can be disastrous because you can push them away from an objective that they were trying to hold, which is very, very cool. And he's got different attacks. He's got a shield throw, which is range four, but doesn't quite do as much damage, right? And then he's got shield slam, which is still close range, but it costs two power, but it does six damage. And of course, they all have their different abilities. Now, at the bottom, you've also got some leadership abilities, which is the star symbol here. Now, these are your superpowers here at the bottom. And these are, sometimes these are permanent things that are always on. Sometimes these are special things that you can activate during your turn. Sometimes they have a cost, sometimes they don't. So for example, Cap has a vibranium shield he can activate. It costs him two to activate it. And when he's targeted uh, by certain types of attacks, he can use this superpower and he adds two dice to his defense. So if he's going to pull up his shield and really get behind it, it's going to cost him two power. So Cap might not want to use that shield slam because he may want to save his energy for defense. So he's a very good defensive character. Uh, he's also got a bodyguard super ability and he's also got a day unlike any other. Now this is a leadership ability and you're only going to be able to have, I believe, one on the, of these on each team, uh, only one leader per team. You don't want like everybody being the, a leader and you know people competing for who's in charge. Um, but these are also, and this one is Affiliation Avengers. So if at least three people on your team are Avengers, then you're going to be able to use that ability. And that's a pretty cool thing because you're going to have some cards that are actually going to show you, you know, who is on which affiliation. And we've got these cards right here. This is, it says all of the characters that are Avengers. And some of these aren't even out yet, but that's a good kind of hint at that the expandability of this team. And if we flip it over, it also has the affiliation of the Cabal, which are some not so nice characters. And they're all in the core set as well. Now, if you do take damage equal to your hit points here, you are going to be uh, dazed and then you'll be injured. And we're going to flip this over. And now uh, some characters actually have different stats. If you'll notice, the artwork has changed and we've got this red background. So we're, you know, we're, we're injured now, but we're not out of the fight yet. Cap can do this all day, right? And as a matter of fact, he gains a new ability called I Can Do This All Day. Uh, so he adds blanks in his defense roll to his total successes, which just makes him a lot more hard to kill. So Cap is a really good example. Now, not every character has new stats on their uh, on their injured side. Some characters are the same on their injured side, but Cap is a special character that does get more powerful once he has been kind of knocked down. He stands back up with a vengeance, and I feel like that's very appropriate for Cap. If you also notice, he's got one more hit point. Instead of only being five, he is now six which is pretty cool. Now, every character does have an injured side, and you'll have to read over them because some of them are the same, some of them are different. Some characters presumably could lose abilities, so if they become injured, now they're weaker. So there's a lot of uh, expandability for them to do more of that. Every game is also going to have crisis cards that kind of dictate a little bit of about the story and how we get victory points. Now, these are important because these basically tell you how you win. They also have the threat level of what the uh, amount of points are going to be. And these can change, although I will point out all of the crisis cards in the core set have a threat level of 17, but it is possible for future crisis cards to have different threat levels. And you're going to use a red and a blue, and basically one of them will involve picking something up and taking it away, and the other one will involve kind of babysitting a certain location. So some of them are going to be grab something and, and extract and pull it away, and some of them are going to be like, you know, guard this location and kind of control this location. So, uh, and, and, and it's going to tell you how you do those on the card. So um, you're going to have an interact ability, and, uh, and, and you can interact here. Now, interacting is not an action, but every character does get two 
actions. So in this case, I'm gonna show you, I have Cap here and I've got Baron Zemo right here and maybe Baron Zemo's uh, getting close to this uh, this cosmic cube fragment, which is one of the things that we have to, and we can get victory points by doing that. And we'll, of course, we'll mark those. We've got this, this tracker here. Uh, we're gonna mark the game for six turns and we're gonna mark victory points up here. So if you're gaining victory points at the end of the turn, we'll be able to mark those on here. Um, now, Cap has two actions he can take. So maybe he wants to do an, an attack against against Baron Zemo there. Uh, he could, you know, check his thing. He's got shield throw, which is range four, and he's got strike, which is range two. So I might say, you know what? I want to strike him. Oh, but he's too far away. I can't reach him with strike. Well, let me check and see if I can reach him with shield throw. And of course, I can at this point. So, you know, I could choose to maybe do I want to move and then strike because strike's going to do more damage. Uh, or maybe I, you know, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I want to uh, maybe I want to move and strike, or maybe I just want to do a shield throw on him, and then maybe do a shield throw on Ultron, who's over there, because you can actually attack two times. Uh, there's there's only certain actions that you can only do once, and those are only going to be actions that are listed on your card. There are certain characters that have actions printed on their card that are, uh, you know, that basically say this is only available once per turn. But unless it says it's only available once per turn, you can do the action as many times or up to two times because you only get two actions. So maybe Cap wanted to move, he would take this M and he would affix this to his base and then he could travel along here and he could move all the way to the end of it or he could stop short. Now, if you were rounding a corner, let's say I was here and I wanted to just around this corner, um, well, that might put me too far, so I could opt to use another movement tool that is a little bit shorter if I wanted to hug a tighter turn or something to that effect. So, but in this case, let's say Cap's gonna move in. He's just gonna move and he's gonna attack. Uh, and we have our range two on this guy now. Uh, so we're gonna attack Baron Zemo. Let's take a look at how combat works. So we've only got one type of die that we're going to use in this game, and they are D8s, eight-sided dice, and they've got all kinds of different sides on them, although they do have two blanks, which is a little bit dangerous. But both attack and defense are going to use the same dice, but we're looking for different results. So uh, first thing is we've got the skull, which is basically kind of like a blank, but the skull is the worst result because in addition to not doing anything useful for you, it also cannot be rerolled or changed. It kind of locks this die in. Uh, we've also got shields, which count as a block, which are you know, really useful if you're defending. We've got hits, which count as a hit, uh, surprisingly enough, and they are useful for when you're attacking. You do have this wild symbol, which can be a hit or a block, depending on if you're attacking or defending. So this is a very good result. There are also certain abilities that will require a wild to trigger them. So wilds are very, very good. On top of that, maybe the best result is this exclamation point here, because this bang can be whatever you want it to be. It's kind of like a wild. It can be a hit or a block. But on top of that, during your initial roll, only the initial roll, not re-rolls, any of these bangs you roll, you're going to add an extra die. You're going to roll some more dice. So if I rolled four of these, I would then be able to take four more dice and roll those. Now, keep in mind, if I roll another bang, I'm not adding any more dice, but they're still, they're probably the best roll you can get. So Cap is gonna roll four dice against Baron Zemo, and Baron Zemo has a melee defense of three. Uh, so if Cap is doing a melee attack, we're gonna, Baron Zemo is gonna get three dice. And Cap is gonna get these four. So I'm just gonna roll these out for you. And Cap rolled pretty poorly. Um, so he rolled a an armor, which is blank, or which is basically nothing for attack, a blank, which is nothing. This one, which cannot be re-rolled. So if I had some kind of ability to let Cap re-roll dice, then uh, he wouldn't be able to re-roll that one. But we did get one hit. So we have one damage coming in. Baron Zemo is going to roll three, and he doesn't get any. Now, Baron Zemo does have an ability that lets him re-roll a die, which didn't matter in that case anyway. So then Baron Zemo would then take one damage, and we've got these damage counters, we can put those on his card. And of course, there are some additional abilities, like with Cap, if he hits, he gets some power. And we can also push, we can push Baron Zemo back a little bit, which is nice to get him maybe away from an objective or to get him out of range of somebody else's benefits or all kinds of different things. And there's even some ways that you can throw characters and kind of knock them into other characters and then even cause damage on top of that. So a lot of cool movement interaction mechanics go along with combat. But there's other ways that we can modify combat too, so I'm gonna talk about some of those.
The other thing I want to talk about with combat are these team tactic cards, which often tends to interact with combat. And these are very cool. You can play these during your turn when you're activating a character, and they all have fantastic artwork on the back. These are really, really cool. Like, I love this one specifically. It's, it's showing Iron Man kind of bounce his beam off of Cap's shield. How many, like, times have we seen this happen or, like, been playing, playing like, a video game where you could do something like that? And it's the coolest moment. So these are a way to add a real cinematic kind of comic book experience to your combat. And they all have a different back, so it, it, like you, it's not going to be a secret what you're holding in your hand. And your opponent, you know, more the more you play, they're going to know, oh, I see you're still holding Ricochet Blast and you haven't played it. Now, these are like once per game, so once you play it, it's going to be gone. Uh, and they'll say whether if they have an affiliation, like if you have to be playing Avengers to do this, or if you're just running a ragtag kind of mix match, like we also have Avengers Assemble, which is another one. And of course that one, ha you can you have to be playing Avengers. So if I was playing a bunch of villains, I probably couldn't play this card. Uh, but Ricochet Blast is going to, you know, do different things. So, you know, they're, you're gonna read the card, you're basically just gonna follow the card text, but they do all kinds of cool things like uh, this one, uh, you know, when you activate, you're going to have two allied characters. If they're uh, within a certain range, they can each spend an energy or a power to play this card, power rather, and the enemy character who you're attacking rolls two fewer dice on all attacks this round to a minimum of one. So basically this is you disarming somebody, making somebody a little bit easier to hit. And then you're gonna use this and then it's gone. And then there are some reactive ones as well, uh, but most of them are active and they're things that you're going to do uh, when, you are, uh, when you're activating. Like I really like this one, this is something that Red Skull might want to do, uh, and it has to be Red Skull, it has to be if you're running a Cabal uh, type of team, and this one can basically allow Red Skull to kind of take somebody who has already activated and be able to reactivate them again, which is really cool. So after you are done, uh, you know, doing your two actions with someone, you're going to mark them as activated. You're gonna put this little token next to them and they're basically done for the whole round. But here's a way where you can get them back and activate them all over again. Of course, it costs some power and they have the chance to take some, cu uh, some damage from the cube uh, by doing that. So you can try to reactivate somebody and there might just be like, they may take a, like three damage as a result of it. So. Uh, it, it's uh, it's kind of a risky thing, but that's kind of the, the comic book feel of something that Red Skull would do. He doesn't care if he hurts his, his subordinates, he needs them back in the fight. So, yeah, and there's a whole lot of these that come with the corset, so there's a lot of ways for you to kind of build up your hand and, and maximize your uh, deck and, tr and just try different tactics, even with the same build, trying different cards can make them play and feel differently. Ultimately, this game is going to go by really quick because you're doing so much more than just attacking each other. You're, you know, moving over terrain. Sometimes you'll have to climb, which will make you go slower. Some characters have flight where they can kind of fly over other terrain. This game is going to work very well with existing terrain. So if you stay tuned and you do watch some of my future content, I'm planning on doing some battle reports with a variety of terrain. And uh, it won't all just be inner city terrain. There's lots of different cosmic exotic locations you can find in the Marvel universe. But you know you're going to be you know trying to pick up these cubes or or and, and there's other there's a lot of other crisis cards too so every game can be totally different but in the I think the uh, tutorial the first one wants you to run cosmic cubes as well as these extremist consoles so you can like heal with them and pick up the cosmic cubes for more power at the cost of your health and you know it's just a great way to kind of learn about how these objectives work. But as you're moving around trying to pick these up and score victory points, you know, every time you move, you're sacrificing the ability to attack or, or throw a car at somebody. And I love this terrain, too, when it comes off, it is actually being, you know, removed from the board. So now all of a sudden you're opening up new lines of sight and new avenues of attack. And some future characters also that are coming out look really exciting as well. So overall, what a blast for your tabletop. So it's final thoughts time. What do I think of Marvel Crisis Protocol? In a nutshell, I absolutely love it. It is one of the most enjoyable gaming experiences I have had in a very long time. I think it's very quickly going to rise to one of my favorite games of all time, as long as the future content continues to be enjoy as enjoyable as this core set was. And uh, there's so much stuff lined up right now, which it has me very excited about the future. But compartmentalizing the future and just looking at the core set, this is fantastic. One of the things that's really great about this is that it is truly a complete gaming experience, all in one box. A lot of games, especially tabletop miniatures games, tend to have a core set that's not really enough for you to really play. 
And this one is enough for you to play with a friend. You don't even need to have your own copy. If you know somebody else that has one, you can split them down the middle and play just like that. Now, there will be a lot more when we get into competitive play and building a list of, you know, 10 heroes and then having to, you know, build a list from within your list. And, and there's a whole lot more to competitive play that will happen once this game is widely available. My review is really just looking at only the core set from that kind of intro, learn to play scenario type of gameplay. Because, well, frankly, there aren't a whole lot of people available right now with core sets for me to play competitively against. But once that time comes, I'll be doing more content. There'll be more battle reports, and there'll be a whole lot more that I plan to do. But I, I really enjoy having fewer characters on the battlefield, and but having so much more that you can do with them. The fact that every character can attack twice at potentially the cost of sacrificing maybe victory points or the ability to move, which is so important with you getting knocked around. In one of my games, I was using a slower character, Crossbones, who has very strong attacks, but he moves very, very slowly. So if he can slowly get up to you, he can hit you really hard. And there was such this give and take of me saying, all right, I'm just going to have to move twice, no attack this round. And then my opponents shot him and did like a knockback effect that pushed him farther away. And it was like infuriating that now I had to walk this guy back. And so now I'm like, all right, well, next time I'm going to take him and kind of, you know, hide behind stuff and kind of sneak up. And now I have different strategies and tactics to try to approach or maybe, you know, or maybe I just activate him last next time instead of putting him right in the line of fire. So, you know, I, I just... I'm talking really fast because I want you to know how much I really enjoy playing this game. It's absolutely wonderful and has me eagerly wanting more. Even losing, it's really exciting because maybe, you know what, maybe I just want to kill Iron Man. Maybe that's my goal. You know, and because it can be hard to actually kill a character. The fact that they everybody kind of gets a second life is a really good aspect to this and makes it less punishing and less of a negative play experience. There are a lot more rules than I talked about during this, because this was meant to just be kind of a brief overview and review. So I will be probably doing a lot more stuff about the rules, including a learn to play. And, you know, I invite you to subscribe to check all of that future content out. But overall, I think this game is absolutely fantastic. I think it's a f great gift for somebody that you love who loves tabletop games who loves marvel and doesn't mind having to do some assembly the only negatives i can say is this might not be a game for everybody if they're new to gaming and don't really like the fact that they'll have to cut out assemble uh glue together and paint miniatures because it is a miniature a miniatures game and a lot of those tabletop experiences do that but not everybody's a big fan of that type of method some people prefer maybe the hero clicks method where stuff is already assembled but you're not going to get the quality that you'll get from something like this this is absolutely wonderful and i'm really can't wait to see what atomic mass games has next a plus rating for me contender for game of the year all right i want to thank you guys so much for watching this video if you like this video go ahead and give it a thumbs up let me know what you think down in the comments below i want to big give a big thanks to atomic mass games for sending this out to me also big thanks to my patrons on patreon you guys are amazing definitely help make this all possible so thank you so much and as always have a great day